Mario Party is the cornerstone of the entire party game genre, although it wasn't actually the first one. The first video games generally recognizable as party games were the 1988 Japan-only Famicom title Momotaro Dentetsu, a spin-off of the long-running Momotaro Densetsu franchise, and the similarly Japan-only 1991 Itadaki Street. Both of these games spawned long-running digital board game franchises, few if any of which have ever been exported out of Japan. Other than Dentetsu and Itadaki Street, there were also some early conversions of Monopoly, one of which was even produced by the mother franchise's Itoi Sugesato. But the party game as we know it began in 1998, with the first Mario Party on the Nintendo 64. A lot of the features we now associate with the genre were only possible because of the Nintendo 64's hardware design. It was the first game console to have four controller ports out of the box, not requiring a cumbersome multi-tap accessory to work with, as well as the first console with an analog stick, which allowed for greater finesse in controlling 3D space. Mario Party's key innovation upon the genre, breaking up each turn with competitive minigames that distributed resources in the form of coins to the players so they could buy items to interfere with their opponents and stars to win the game, were made possible by the multiple configurations and large number of buttons the Nintendo 64 gamepad supported. The greater depth and variety Mario Party brought to the genre and its cast of iconic characters spawned a vast wave of imitators in the late 1990s and early 2000s, including Dice de Chocobo on the original PlayStation, Sonic Shuffle on the Dreamcast, the multi-platform Pac-Man Fever, and numerous others. Even Itadaki Street took after emulating Mario Party's formula with Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy in Itadaki Street Special on the PlayStation 2, which featured crossover characters from Square Enix's RPG catalog and ultimately transformed the entire franchise into a crossover party series. But after 20 years of party games and party modes like Wii Party U, Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, the Kingdom Hearts Command Board, or the Sonic and the Secret Rings party mode, few games have managed to really measure up to the original Mario Party trilogy on the Nintendo 64. Even Mario Party itself found 2 and 3 hard to top, with only a handful of games recapturing the magic of their predecessors. There are a lot of reasons we can unpack for that, like underdeveloped online multiplayer, the continual focus on alternate play modes and revamped items over additional boards, and structural changes within the industry, but probably the most blatant is the issue of board design itself. The heart of a digital board game like Mario Party is the way the board structure changes player behavior, upsets planned strategies, and rewards good moves and item timing. With more than 15 games in the series and around 80 to 100 boards between them, it's inevitable that some end up better received than others, but I'm going to zero in on a few we already know to be good and what it is about them that makes them fun. If you ask a Mario Party veteran what their favorite boards are, a couple recurring names come up. Boards like Mario's Rainbow Castle, Western Land, Woody Woods, Spaceland, Castaway Bay, and so on. Most of these boards come from the first three to four games, with a handful going up to Mario Party 6 or 8, and virtually none originating in Mario Party 10, Island Tour, Star Rush, or Super Mario Party. So going with the idea that the board design in the older games was part of why they were better received, let's start with one of the classics. Waluigi's Island. Waluigi's Island is effectively the final boss of Mario Party 3. It's the final board the player runs through in the story mode, it has to be unlocked for party mode by completing the story mode, and once they've cleared it, the only thing standing between them and the credits is a single minigame. While the board embodies all the wackiness of Waluigi himself, that's not what I'm here to focus on. Instead, I want to turn your attention to the layout of the board's spaces. Every Mario Party game up until Mario Party 9 had players roll a 10-sided dice block to decide how far they would move each turn. This created a huge degree of variance in how far any one player would travel. The difference between maximum and minimum rolls on a 10-sided die versus a 6-sided one are obviously great. One player might move 10 spaces in the same turn and another player only travels one, and the layout of the first 10 spaces of each board has to be balanced around this to prevent players from gaining an insurmountable lead through first turn rolls. Variance in a game is fun, because it produces new experiences every time the game is played, but making a good game is an act of balancing variance with player input, so that the human beings playing the game don't become unnecessary. If players feel like they have no input at all, they're not having fun anymore. They're just sitting in the same room as a game that's playing itself. That said, how does Waluigi's Island lay out its first 10 spaces? Space 1 is a red space that takes 3 coins away from the player that lands on them. Spaces 2 through 5 and 9 are blue spaces that give 3 coins. 6, 8, and 10 are happening spaces that advance that part of the board's dynamite countdown by 1. And Space 7 is an item space that triggers a minigame where players try to win an item. 
the most important feature of the first 10 spaces is actually the item shop, which is placed so that any player rolling a 2 or higher will pass by it. And with every player having received 10 coins at the start of the game, all of them will have a chance to buy something. Items are extremely important in the Mario Party franchise because along with the action-based minigames and branching board paths, they are the only way players can influence the result of a game via skilled play. If you took out the items, the minigames, and the board branches, you'd essentially just have Hudson Soft's original Momotaro Dentetsu on the Famicom, a completely chance-based die-rolling game in the style of Japan's traditional Sugoroku boards, where random variance drives the entirety of the game and players have no input whatsoever. What can players buy with their first 10 coins? Well, the item shop in Mario Party 3 randomly alternates between Toad and Baby Bowser's shops every time a player passes it, and the items Toad or Baby Bowser sell are re-rolled every turn. However, there will always be at least 3 5-coin items and 1-2 to 10-coin items available for purchase. For 5 coins, Toad's shop can carry the skeleton key to open doors, the mushroom to roll a second dice block, and the cellular shopper to instantly buy from either Toad's or Baby Bowser's shop regardless of its user's location on the board. Meanwhile, Baby Bowser can sell the Skeleton Key, the Reverse Mushroom to reverse any player's movement direction, or the Poison Mushroom to force a character to use a three-sided die instead of their normal one. If the player decides to use all ten of their starting coins, they can grab the Golden Mushroom from Toad to get two additional dice blocks on a roll, or from Baby Bowser's shop, the Coin Stealing Bowser Suit, Item Stealing Plunder Chest, or Bowser Phone. The Bowser Phone is an especially attractive choice, because if the player uses it on themselves while they have zero coins remaining, instead of a negative event, Bowser will give them 20, 30, 40, or 50 coins, guaranteeing they at least double their money. While on Waluigi's Island the Skeleton Key isn't that useful, on the other maps Chilly Waters and Spiny Desert, valuable events are hidden behind the Skeleton Key doors, including the Star Stealing Boo. The Mushroom and Reverse Mushroom are both powerful items that allow a player to better control space, rolling higher to chase down the current star or reversing the direction of others to deny them access to it, or reversing their own direction to get into a space or event they would otherwise miss. But the most powerful item the player can buy is probably the Cellular Shopper, because it allows the player to put off purchasing a more powerful item like the Magic Lamp or Boo Bell until they have the cash on hand, and even if it were stolen by an opponent, it would only be as useful as their wallet is deep. So to a player that's good at minigames, the Cellular Shopper is the safest investment. Spaces 6, 8, and 10 being happening spaces makes sense from a game balance perspective. When the happening spaces have been landed on five times, the dynamite on this portion of the island explodes and robs all players standing on it of all their coins, and driving the countdown lower while awarding no direct coins is effectively a punishment for high rolling. What makes less sense, at least at a glance, is making space 9 blue, while the very first space of the board is a red space. In a game like Mario Party where movement is everything, rolling low is a punishment in itself, while rolling high naturally puts a player in a better position. So why would you further reward a player for high rolling and punish another for being behind? While in any other board game it would make sense to reward low rolls with money and punish high ones with losses to close the distance between lucky and unlucky players, in Mario Party the board design hinges on how the system assigns minigames. The colors players are standing on at the end of a turn are used to determine what minigame is played. If all players are on blue spaces, then a 4v4 free-for-all starts. If two players are on red and two on blue, then a 2v2 team minigame gets rolled up. And if only one player is on red and three are on blue, a 1v3 begins. This is important because in both 4v4s and 1v3s, only one person can normally earn coins, while three others are denied anything at all. And in a 1v3, the balance is generally shifted in favor of the solo player. This is purposeful. The player that rolled low at the start of the game and landed on the only red space is put in a position to earn more coins through the minigame than they lost by landing on that space, but only if they're skilled enough to make up for it. Early game red spaces effectively initiate a skill check and put a better player ahead, while the other players have good board position but not enough coins to make effective use of it. Of course, this all hinges on the idea that the Mario Party series' 1v3 minigames are biased in favor of a skilled solo player, but how true that actually is varies from game to game. In general, Mario Party 3 does favor the solo player. 
For example, Thwomp Poll runs on the idea that a single player can sequence together different button inputs more easily than three players each entering one in the sequence, while Boulder Ball, Coconut Conk, and Tidal Toss all put control of a large space in the hands of a single player, while asking the three-person team to coordinate in that same area. And the area that's large to the solo player becomes cramped to the team as a result, making it difficult to work together without getting in each other's way. In effect, the 1v3s are a comeback mechanic for a player put behind by poor roles. In this light, Waluigi's Island places its first red space perfectly. The worst die roll possible yields the biggest coin return, at least until the values of spaces are doubled during the last five turns of the game, by which time players should have developed their position enough for it to not matter. After the player gets off Dynamite Island, they're immediately confronted by Waluigi Island's central movement node, the Action Time Gear. To travel to a destination, the turn player has to time their jump so that they press the button just as the spinning arrow lands on the space they want to go to. From the central gear, the player can branch out into one of three regions. The western path takes the player to a looping area that branches back into Dynamite Island, but also has a drawbridge leading to the northwest aisle, which has a unique gimmick of its own. Every turn, all of the spaces on the aisle except for the bank space become one of eight other space types. Blue, Red, Item, Happening, Bowser, Battle, Chance Time, or Game Guy. Since the change happens at the start of the turn, players always have the opportunity to weigh the risk involved with going into the Northwest Isle, and they'll never go into it accidentally because it's only accessible from a path branch. The northern path off the action time gear branches into one of two directions, heading west into the random aisle or east past the second item shop and onto a booby trap path leading to Boo. Boo is always an important resource in the Mario Party games, swinging the game harder the later on he's invoked by stealing more coins on the last turns of the game or swiping stars to turn the tide. Unlike some of the other boards, Waluigi's Island doesn't gate Boo behind a skeleton key door, but instead forces the player to choose between two branches. One part of the branch is trapped and sends the player back to start, while the other is safe to cross. Ultimately, this northeastern path, as well as the east path off of the action time gear, both converge in the same place, a red pipe warping the player back to the green pipe at the start of the board. In fact, every area of Waluigi's Island loops back to the start via red pipes or loops back to Dynamite Island, driving up the chances of the dynamite going off the longer a game goes on and the more loops the players make, pressuring them into utilizing their coins before that can inevitably happen. So what makes this board good, and why is it so loved? The first point is that it makes getting around easy. The three red pipes in the looping paths make it much easier to get around than on other big boards like Deep Blooper Sea or Woody Woods, and the dynamite sets the terms of how long the player's wallet can stay active for before they have to start over building up a coin total to spend on items and stars. The item shop is placed perfectly at the start to give every player their fair chance to shape the game both as they first cross it and as they loop back from the other parts of the map and the spaces are distributed at a 45 to 7 blue to red ratio, which is slightly better odds of landing on blue compared to the normal 30 to 3 most boards use. Boo is always powerful and game-changing whenever his star swiping services are available, but Waluigi's Island makes reaching him something the player has to dedicate time to in advance, knowing they may fail one or more attempts before finally getting past the booby trap. So this is a board that shapes the player's behavior with risk and reward gates the most powerful tool in the game behind an obstacle, and gives the player choices about how they want to play. And that is, in a nutshell, how you make a good Mario Party board. You give players choices and balance their roles with mechanical elements that bounce those falling behind forward, and push those getting too far ahead back. In other genres, this kind of design is generally looked down upon, but in a party game, the moment a player's lead becomes insurmountable, the actions of the other players become meaningless, and the game stops being fun. Think about the old board game Monopoly. Everybody that's played it knows it stops being fun long before the game is up, as one player acquires just such an insurmountable lead, and the other players stop mattering entirely, slowly meandering around the board as they wait to go bankrupt or just conceding outright. Elizabeth Maggie deliberately designed Monopoly this way in 1902, so that players would stop having fun and call a vote to switch to the alternative anti-monopolist rule set, where the objective was to double the poorest player's net wealth rather than make all the other players go bankrupt and throw them in the workhouse. In Anti-Monopoly, or as it was originally called, Prosperity, 
income tax and super tax were eliminated in favor of managing all tax through land rent. Rent was paid into the community chest instead of to a space's owner. And landing on the community chest space caused all players to split the money in the chest equally, thereby benefiting from each other improving their own properties rather than from deploying high rents against each other. Maggie intended for the contrast between Monopoly and Anti-Monopoly, along with various play elements like the $200 the player collects when they pass Go, to demonstrate the effects of wealth inequality and the potential solutions presented by land tax, wealth redistribution, and universal basic income. In effect, Monopoly was designed to stop being fun, so that players could play Anti-Monopoly instead. And the way it stopped being fun was by making it impossible for other players to get back in the game past an inevitable threshold. Even more than a hundred years ago, game designers knew that if the other players stopped being able to influence the game, they would give up and play something else. That's the heart of what a good board in any game is. Something you don't stop having fun with. And that's why we can go back to Waluigi's Island over and over, but get sick of Mega Fruit Paradise after a single game. This has been Toya, thank you for joining me today. If you liked what you saw, please consider liking and subscribing to support the channel. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pillowfort at Toya, on Twitch at DecodeToya, and of course, right here at Maniac's channel.